Good evening, everyone. So, welcome to Fireport 80. So, this is a monthly technology session hosted by us, Fire Corporation, uh, where technology enthusiasts converge to discuss and uh, analyze the emerging trends in technology. Uh, the session aims to provide a platform for both amateurs and experts uh, to share, to discuss about the emerging tools and technologies uh, in the IT industry. The objective of this endeavor is to uh, like enable peer group learning, uh, knowledge sharing and knowledge gaining. Uh, so welcome to the 108th edition of Fireport 80. First, we will be having the Tech Byte session where we discuss on the technology changes that happened in the last month. So I welcome Anjali uh, for the Tech Byte session. where a new uh, exciting feature emerged the ability to generate AI images right from the search bar. Google is enhancing its search generative experience by adding a new image generation tool. This tool allows users to create images directly from test prompts in the search bar. Google is yet to roll out image generation capabilities in India, but we can still try it by using VPN. Here is a demo video. Next, uh, let's just shift our attention to Microsoft, uh, which has introduced a Copilot, an AI companion designed to be by your side every day with a host of remarkable capabilities. Microsoft has announced the launch of Microsoft Copilot, an AI companion designed to re revolutionize the way people interact with the technology and enhance productivity. According to Microsoft, the solution will be available in Windows 11. Microsoft 365 Edge and Bing for an AI-powered experience across applications and devices. Uh, let's see a video how it works on Excel. Copilot in Excel helps you make sense of all your data. Say you need to analyze this quarter's sales results. You start by asking Copilot to analyze the data and give you three key trends. Within seconds, You've got what you need, but you want to drill in. You ask Copilot a follow-up question about one of the trends. Copilot creates a new sheet, giving you a sandbox to play in and helping you better understand what's happening. You ask Copilot to visualize what contributed to the decline in sales growth this period. Copilot adds a little color to make the problem jump off the page. Now you want to dig deeper and ask a follow-up question with a what-if scenario. Copilot not only answers your question, it creates a simple model and even asks if you want to learn more about what it did with a step-by-step -step breakdown. Finally, you can ask it to create a graph of your projected model. Copilot in Excel turned a sea of data into clear insights and actions. Now on to Tesla. Tesla launches official API documentation to th support third-party apps. Electric car company Tesla has released the official application programming interface documentation to support third-party apps. Uh, at this moment, the API only covers the command that you can send it to your car through the Tesla app, and it can ping the data from your car that goes to the app. The change is going to make official and the third-party fleet management apps and the uh, smart uh, smartwatch integration apps, etc. Uh, turning our focus to AI development, say hello to Mojo Programming Language, a specialized language designed for AI developers. Uh, Mojo combines the usability of Python with the performance of C, leading to greater programmability of AI hardware and extensibility of AI models. 
it's basically an enhanced version of python uh, specifically designed for ai developers mojo sdk is uh, currently available on linux and will add support for windows and mac os in the coming months Uh, lastly, let's take a look on Kerala startup mission, ambitious plans to foster young coding talents. Kerala startup mission has rolled out top 100 series challenge to identify, reward and engage the talents in programming, product design and product making with the potential to build a technology product that can tap the global market. It's a 45 day coding challenge. For more details and registration, you can visit uh, Hadil Global website. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. That was really insightful. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Jugal, a senior cyber security and consultant at EYGDS with more than four years of experience. Uh, in offensive security, uh, and he is a tech enthusiast with a passion for emerging technologies. Jugal is going to talk about the currently followed application security practices, commonly observed security vulnerabilities, and how, how companies, companies can, 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 can security forward approach. approach. I'm, so I'm so happy, happy and, and proud, proud to welcome Jugal for the start. Hello. 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 Ah, okay. Hello. I uh, hope the issue is now resolved. Yeah, looks better. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. So today we'll be talking about cybersecurity. Again, I'm not going to introduce myself again. Thanks, Ardi, for doing that. Uh, but just to give you a glimpse, my name is Jugal, and I'm a cybersecurity specialist. I've been working in AppScan security and application security for the last four or five years. So yeah, uh, today we are going to look at cybersecurity. But cybersecurity is a very, very wide topic, right? It's not really just focusing on one area. It is a big umbrella that consists of a lot of stuff, right? And today's session, I'm not going to look at it from a security perspective. I know it sounds a little weird that a security guy is standing here and telling you that the session is not going to be from a security perspective. But today, we'll be looking at an organizational view and how developer, maybe there are some of you who are interested in development. So we are trying to see if we can present cybersecurity that's more understandable in terms of organizational view as well as from a development perspective. Does that make sense? All right, uh, let's get started. Okay, so first of all, let's look at what cybersecurity is, right? Because otherwise, this entire conversation will be futile. So, cybersecurity, uh, like I said, comprises of a lot of different branches, but we'll start with the major concepts of cybersecurity and information security. And it starts with the CIA triad, okay? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Can someone here tell me what these could mean? 
like it's a very simple term right confidentiality integrity and availability what do you understand from that term when you hear those anyone wants to take a guess data privacy okay good answer data privacy any other suggestions any other answers no i'll go with data privacy so basically uh, we need to ensure that the data is protected right not just the data the de devices the resources that handle the data should also be protected so when we come to the confidentiality integrity availability triangle i'll just go i'm just going to break down each one separately right confidentiality what is a confidential data we have seen that again and again right when do you say something is confidential yeah that is that is something that cannot be exposed to other people right you need the secrecy of that particular information that's where the confidentiality comes into place then there is integrity how do you say are you a person of integrity do you have integrity not sure not sure if you have integrity what about you do you have integrity why do you say you have integrity you stand by your word right you are trustworthy right same concept here how do we know that the data that we are dealing with has not been tampered with okay suppose you download an application to install on your system how do you know that it's the actual original application that was built by the developer and not you know one with other stuff added to it like malware and stuff like that added right that is the answer that we look for in integrity and then we move to availability availability is easy right why do you think data should be available you should access you should have access to everything at any time right whatever data is and that's the availability part so i'll give you an example to make this more uh, understandable for you okay let's say we are going to book my show to book a ticket or any ticket booking site let's say leo okay i think leo is a hot topic now so let's go to leo you want to book a ticket for leo for you and your friends okay you are trying to access the application but you are not able to do it you are not able to book the tickets can you say that the availability is met then no so in this scenario just imagine an attacker who is sending thousands of requests to book my show and not allowing you to do it okay and that is an attack because now you are not able to have access to a system which you should be able to access just because there are attackers out there who is trying to prevent it okay so this will be the core concept of information security i know that information security and cyber security are quite distinct stuff uh, but they are used interchangeably we'll get to that in a second but basically the entire security concept is based on how we can protect the cia trial okay let's move on so you're going to ask me like why am i standing here and talking about cyber security what is the relevance of cyber security in this world so if you look at the last 5 10 years this is probably a very booming word right cyber security it keeps popping up wherever we go so why exactly is that and i have answers for you here because cyber crime is skyrocketing like anything right this is the predictions until 2027 and this is the loss that's expected in trillion dollars i repeat trillion dollars trillion us dollars so now can someone tell me uh, if you have seen any recent cyber attacks not even recent anything that you know of any cyber security incident that you are familiar with aha uh -huh, blockchain right uh -huh. yep perfect any other instances heard about malware attacks happens all the time right heard about ransomware attacks that has happened in the past right where uh, your data will be blocked encrypted by somebody else by an attacker and then you have to pay to get the data back right ransomware attacks yep yeah. sorry windows. yeah on windows yes it was a very common attack uh, that happened like maybe 7 years ago yeah around that time and then i think data breaches are very common right we have heard about that along you know from from i think probably 20 30 years ago we've been hearing this thing that data breach that has happened a lot so i mean recently i remember uh, during my college days i think there was an attack on uh, dominos website which allowed you know exploited all of the databases and they could get information about the uh, the purchase history right they could find the contact information the addresses the credit card information all of that my friend reached out to me said hey i got your address from here i was like hey what that doesn't make sense but that did happen data breach happened and it's not just with small companies or you know multinational communities it happens everywhere So remember what happened to Sony Pictures a while ago? Sony Pictures was also attacked. They lost their many popular scripts. They lost movies that was completely edited. It was such a mess, and they asked for ransom to get it back. So cyber threats happen all at, all the time, and this will comprise combine of all the uh, attacks that's possible, right? And the numbers just keep going up. 
That is the reason why cybersecurity is very important these days, especially from an organizational view. Again, that's more data, money getting burned. That's not good anyway. Okay, so we are looking at $6.9 billion worth of loss as per FBI's data. So that is definitely not good, right? So just to put it into perspective, this is unacademy plus not security. You all see the ads on YouTube, right? Not VPN, not VPN, not VPN. Not security system plus unacademy is the total valuation of these two companies fall within 7 billion. So imagine that. The one year's loss accounts to the entire valuation of two companies. So imagine if a small company is affected by this attack, how much damage will be caused to them, right? Simple as that. So now I'm gonna to go to a very uh, relevant question, right? When I say my data is lost, or when I say I've been hit by an attack, what is my loss? What is my, uh, you know, monetary loss, or what is my loss that's happening to me? Can someone tell me? So maybe your mobile device is hacked, or you lose some important files from your laptop. What happens to you? Sorry? You got? Yeah, you, you'll go nuts. Absolutely, you'll go crazy because you lost your data. And maybe there is a monetary value to it after all, because you lose your phone or you lose your laptop. You have a monetary value for it. But now think of it from an organizational view. What does it entail? So an organization, when it starts losing data, when it starts having not, you know, being able to off offer services to other people, what is the impact that they have? It's not just monetary, right? Because for us, it's very easy. If we lose something, that's fine. It's a monetary loss. We get over it or cry about it for a few days. That's fine. But from organization, it's multifold, right? Because once you are hit by a threat, you not just lose the resources, but there's also so much else that happens. So number one is reputation loss. Because now these services don't trust you anymore. So if I couldn't book tickets on book my show, would I go back and try there again next week? Absolutely not. Or maybe I lost some data by investing in some, uh, by going to the website of a mutual fund company. I went there to their website, gave my information. Next day, I know my data is leaked. Would I go there again? Absolutely not, right? So that's where it comes to. There is a lot of brand and reputation loss that organizations have to incur. So that is why the entire valuation of how companies are affected by cybersecurity threats is always on the higher side. Now, uh, we did discuss about how cybersecurity is like a big umbrella. Uh, we're going to break it down into some small components. Again, it doesn't really encompass all the topics that we have under cybersecurity, but I'm just going to break it down to a few so that it becomes easy for us to understand, right? We'll start with network security. What could that be? What is network security? We all work in a corporate culture, right? What is the network that we are talking to here? Correct. Yeah, the network that we internally connect with that needs to be protected. Right, at all times. Similarly, there will be many applications that are hosted outside of our network. Right? It will be an externally hosted websites, web applications, whatever it is. Right? So we need protection there and we need to ensure that people who only need access are allowed access. Okay? External people shouldn't have access to our internal networks because internal networks are used for communication within the organization. So someone from outside should never be able to access it. And then we have information security. Like I said, information security and cybersecurity are sometimes interchangeably used. Never, it's not the same thing. But information security focuses on how we can protect the information that we have. So for example, let's take, once again, go to an organizational view, right? In an organizational, what is the information that they're protecting? Can anyone tell me what information they might have? Client data, perfect, client data. They have employee data, employee details, employee payment structure, all of it. They have client data. And they have hardware and other tools that also need protection, right? That contain all the data. So information security just means that you need to protect all of this. And then again, all the information is not the same, right? There are some information that's much more secure or needs much more security than the others. So for example, I'm gonna uh, just list out a few information that I might have. My name, is that sensitive? Not that sensitive, right? My name, that's fine. There could be hundreds or thousands of jubbles out there, so that's fine. What about my contact number? Is it unique to me? Is it something sensitive? It is sensitive. Okay, now let's go a little further. Okay, I'm gonna share my health records. Is that dangerous? It's very dangerous, right? I share my credit card number. Again, that too is very dangerous. So there are different types of data that becomes more or less, uh, that need more or less security. So based on that, we need to protect all these details with that kind of 
that level of protection. And yeah, please. Sorry, we just got started. We were going through the basics. Yeah. Okay, uh, sometimes companies are also forced to ensure that they have the strictest security possible. So in these instances, we talked about how uh, the credit card information or the health records are sensitive. So there are also governmental regulations in place to ensure that the companies that deal with this data have a certain level of protection. So we have the payment card uh, interface, the PCI standards, uh, just like that we have the GDPR, which is the general data protection regulations. So like that, there are a lot of regulations set down by different governments and agencies to ensure that the information that is held by a company is always secure. Again, depending on what kind of data they deal with. And then there is HIPAA for health records. They need to comply with the HIPAA regulations to make sure that the data is properly secured. Moving on to endpoint security. So all companies have endpoints that they work with, right? This could be desktops, laptops, mobile devices, testing, the, whatever it is, right? You have a lot of endpoint devices. Then again, your network devices, the routers and stuff like that, it's all connected, right? So how do you protect your endpoints? That's important. Okay, forget about that. Let's take a simple example. How do you protect your computer? Antivirus, malware, anti-malware, stuff like that, right? Just like that, there needs to be an endpoint security for each device that a company has, like an organization has. And it's very imperative that we make sure security is ensured for these endpoints as well. Moving on to cloud security. So cloud is again a buzzword now, right? Everything is hosted on the cloud. You have computing power coming from cloud. You have got storage instances running. So it, it's very important that the cloud resources are also, also protected, right? How do you access data from the cloud? How do external third parties access the cloud? How is the data fetched? How is the processing done? Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So Azure will have its own protections, but the way we fetch code or we run instances there will also needs to be protected, right? So there are certain guidelines that we have to follow so that the communication between the cloud services are properly done, right? So if the communication, there is a mistake in the configuration setup, then everything is lost. Inherently, all of these cloud services will have its own protection, but the way we store the keys, the way we interact with them has to be secure as well, right? Makes sense, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do that. So yeah, that's cloud security. And then moving on to application security. This is gonna be the crux of our discussion today, right? We're gonna forget about the rest for now. We'll just focus on application security for the rest of the day. So application security, what does application mean? Is it just the mobile applications? Because these days when you hear application, it's just Snapchat and WhatsApp and Facebook, right? But application can be anything. It can be a mobile application. It can be a, a web application. It can be APIs, uh, it can be a thick client, like an exe file that you run on your machine, it can be anything, right? All of these are applications. So today we are gonna be primarily looking at application security. And now I have a question for everybody. So again, I'm, I know that I'm asking a lot of why questions. I kind of, I'm very fixated on whys. So yeah, why application security? So I have four images here. Let's have a quick game, right? I have four images here. Can someone tell me why I have put these four images and then put application security as a connection to that? Take your time, I'm not gonna answer this. Okay, good. Okay, kind of, kind of, we are getting there. We are getting there, hot. Uh, uh, not really, not really. So these are like four services, I'll give you a hint, right? Four services. Uh, no, I, I think you were, uh, the initial answer was closer to what I was looking for. No, like like he said, these are all use cases for applications, but also these used to be all done manually, right? None of this was done through applications. Mailing, communication, you used to do it separately, one to one. Either you sent mails, written mails and stuff like that. Now it's all mailers. You have Outlook, Gmail, whatever, right? And then your currency. 
do you pay with money anymore like liquid currency no right we all go for e transactions online transactions upi whatever we can think of so that's gone and then it's it's a more you know complicated stuff you go to uh, a restaurant to order something do you get a print out of the menu anymore i mean i haven't seen it in a long time i mean we do have places that still serve menus but the problem is nowadays no one has a menu you go there scan the qr either you install an application or you go to their website and start booking stuff right and then even you pay there has it made our life easy maybe have you contributed to the community as in we are building you know less paper all that get that but it has also made our life a little more complicated because it was easy you just look at it order one tea they bring you the tea drink leave it was easy as that not anymore right you have to go through an application view and look at everything order and move ahead and finally the most annoying thing keys car keys it used to be very easy you just go in open the car drive simple now it is that doesn't work anymore many don't have a you know don't even have a physical key anymore you have your application go nearby nfc whatever lock in go in it's an application again has it made life easier maybe but at the same time now there is more stress because there are so many applications nowadays so now our mobile phones and computers are swiss army knives so in the past we just used it for calling we just use it for messaging not anymore we have our banking services there we use it for ticket booking we use it for just about everything the transactions everything right your banking information is there you will find your health records because you will have your other apps installed as well so nowadays there is a lot of data in your devices a lot of applications also installed there which means if it's compromised you are not just losing some inconsequential data you're losing a lot of very sensitive information as well and the second point so every company now has a website right does anyone disagree with me on that every company has a website now right whether they have a service to offer or not doesn't really matter everybody has a website that is kind of the face of that company right that's the first way you look at a company you want to know about a company you go to their website search about them that's the initial step so that kind of brings up the point right if your application is not built well if your web interfaces are not good if there are security issues with your application then it's completely broken right does that make sense so yeah uh, because the applications act as the company's uh, gateway to company services for the client it needs to be properly maintained the security should be there and then uh, the devices like we said mobile phones and other devices they are not really secure by the long shot like the android phones that we have not really secure have a lot of issues within it and it's quite easy to exploit it as well even like big back doors can be installed so there's a huge threat with those kinds of devices right okay <clears throat> now let's look at some of the issues right so um, has anyone so do, do we have a lot of cyber security enthusiasts here like a show of hand okay awesome that's that's quite a huge number that's nice that's nice so yeah uh, we're going to be looking at what are the common issues that you find in a web application okay i'm going to take web application as a sample case i'm not going to look at mobile and other cases we're just going to focus on mobile application sorry web applications for now and uh, i'm not going to do much of the work because avas has already defined everything so if you can go and search for avas you will find what they are so they are an open source security project that ensures all the security practices are there they do surveys to make sure that the data is collected on findings they update the vulnerability list so ovas from time to time uh, every 4 years they refresh the list of the common vulnerabilities okay so ovas uh, 2021 list is what we're going to look at because i'm not going to curate a list ovas already has it ready for me so i'm just going to leverage that so the first one is broken access control okay what does that mean when you hear the term broken access control what comes to your mind okay perfect perfect you need to have an authentication to your system right so let me ask you a follow up question what's the difference between authentication and authorization is it the same thing okay can someone tell me the difference uh okay kind of kind of we can actually get more to the point difference between authentication and authorization what do you think aha uh -huh. okay okay yep i i'll take both those answers so this is how it works right authentication is 
you are proving your identity to someone okay so when you come in to the front door if you have an id card they let you in right that is your authentication they need to prove your identity to let you in and then there is authorization are you authorized to come inside so that happens when you come inside to certain rooms do you have access to that particular room do you have access to go there are you an admin on a website so that is where that point comes in or the difference between authorization and authentication so authorization is kind of like a higher level and it assigns you to certain task are you authorized to do it are you allowed to go in there that's a different thing altogether all right so yes we are true about that uh, we are talking about authentication how can you authenticate how can an attacker bypass this so that is a major concept of broken access control so uh, some examples of this would include privilege escalation so what does that name uh, ring a bell privilege escalation what could it be right exactly perfect perfect that's a typical example of a uh, vertical privilege escalation we are trying to get more permissions than what you are supposed to be given right and then there is something called an insecure direct object reference or idor in an idor you are trying to access other people's data because the data is stored in a sequential manner okay so for an example let's say you are looking at a, a website that shows your policy information okay for a mutual fund or a health insurance whatever and it's the number for your policy id is 1234 okay then 1 2 3 uh, sorry 1 2 3 5 could be other persons records 1 2 3 6 could be another persons so there needs to be a protection mechanism that makes sure that you are able to access only your data and not other people's data so if an attacker is able to just randomly increase that number and get data on other people then that falls under an idor attack and that is a broken access control okay moving on to cryptographic failures so as we all know to protect data we need to make sure that it's somehow masked right and that can be in the form of encryption hashing whatever you want to do right so in in this scenario we are trying to make sure that whatever data is to be passed needs to be protected if that is not the case then that falls under a cryptographic failure so typical example is all of our applications nowadays use https right that is using the tls to make sure that the encryption layer is there so that uh, others cannot snoop on it right an attacker cannot actually see what is going in transit because that needs to be encrypted so that is where the tls parts comes in and then um, we need to use ciphers with strong strength these are like older ciphers we don't use anymore so whenever we are encrypting data we need to make sure that we use very strong ciphers or complicated ciphers so that attackers can't really uh, enumerate it okay injection injection what does injection mean it's not the injection that you have some people are more scared of injections than others sql injection perfect cross site scripting yes yes so these are injections so what happens in an injection attack is you are expecting some kind of input from somebody okay and it didn't necessarily be in your ui field it can be in other inputs as well so how an attacker is able to modify that input and inject payloads in so at the back end we could be using sql databases we could be using javascripts or other scripts at the back end so how is an attacker able to modify and run codes on your system that's the scenario with an injection attack so if they are able to throw in payloads that cause a cross site scripting or an sql injection attack that comes under a injection failure now this is a very common issue this has been the case for a long time so as you can see 94% of the applications that's being tested today have some form of injection attack there right and then there is in insecure design so uh, insecure design is a relatively new entrant into the ovas top 10 so in okay i'll give you an example insecure design is kind of difficult to fix it so especially when you are thinking of an organizational view it's it's quite impossible to think about this because just imagine the scenario right let's go back to that what example we were talking about the the ticket booking example for example okay so uh, should you be allowed to book minus one tickets no right there should be a mechanism in place that prevents you from doing that similarly i'll give you another scenario right uh, we talked about how people can bot and try to buy the same thing right thousands of bots could try to add, uh, buy tickets and then you are not getting it should that be allowed should a, a company allow bots to come on their platform and then automatically book stuff so that the regular users don't get it no so there needs to be some mechanism in place to prevent it and the logic should be there so i'll give another example so you buy something on amazon it's supposed to cost you uh, 100 rupees okay but at the time of the checkout you just have to pay 50 rupees so should that happen 
there should be a validation in place that prevents that right so that is kind of a business logic if you are able to bypass that and create an attack that's a typical example of how your design should be better so the entire um, fi fixing or the remediation of an insecure design should come from the early stages whenever you are planning about an application whenever you are planning on what kind of data will be handled that's the point where you have to look at the design concepts uh, on insecure design yeah so for example we, let's talk about the business logic bypass itself right so there are different ways an attacker can actually modify that data parameter the value so for example amazon you're buying something for 35 dollars at the last checkout page is it validating with the back end that's one thing that you can quickly check so there are different ways to do it there's something called a response editing where an attacker will actually modify the response and then try to make sure that the money goes through. So the back end, it still shows $35, but at the last page, he is able to modify it and make it $10. So we need some checks in place so that it's prevented. Okay. Yeah, so that's insecure design. And moving on to security misconfiguration. This is again a, a, a huge bucket. Like we'll have a lot of configuration issues. Uh, and a key example is we have cookies everybody is familiar with cookies right if a cookie is not set properly with its right flags it's exploitable like that cookie can be leaked it can be its information can be leaked it can be reused people can just kind of oversee and steal it from you once you're done with your session a lot of issues there and similarly uh, default passwords that's a big concern right so every software you install or every service you pull in there is a default password set, okay? Whether it's a database, whether it's some other service, there is a default password. The first step would be to change it. If you're still using the default password, the attackers also know it. They can Google it, they'll find the default password and they have access to your system, right? So always change your default password. And then vulnerable and outdated components. I think that is pretty self-explanatory, right? Vulnerable and outdated components. Yeah, so I don't even have examples for those. Uh, anything, so whenever, so always try to update your uh, the third party library set you deploy, whatever services you have, uh, may maybe it's a service servers that you're running on, make sure it's always updated. And if there is a security bug, look out and see if there is any fixes deployed. So if you have a fix or a patch, install it as well. So if you don't, that's a problem. Okay, identification and authentication failure. Right. I think we already talked about the difference between authentication and authorization. So again, uh, how can you actually bypass it? Uh, an improper session timeout, a shoulder surfing. So do you know what a shoulder surfing is, a session surfing is? Okay, can someone tell me how that works? Yeah, it can be shoulder surfing, yes, exactly. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a movie called Uri Vatakan Selfie, right? In which they were asking, how did you get the password? Why do you have to hack to get the password? You just look when they type, right? Yeah, similar scenario for shoulder surfing. So once you're done with your session and you walk away from your computer, someone else sits down, uses that same session. That can be a shoulder surfing. So we need to make sure that the authentication is proper. There should be timeout set. So if you're not using it for a long time, it should go out. Another example I can give is probably uh, on your mobile devices. If you have a mobile application for banking, after a certain point of time, if you are not doing anything, after an activity, it will automatically lock out, right? Because it's securing something. So if you don't have security checks like that in place, that is a uh, authentication failure. And then we have software and data integrity failures. I think we already discussed about this initially. So when you're downloading something or when you're adding package, how do you ensure that it's the right one? How do you make sure that it's not really one with malicious code injected to it? Because then you download it, you patch over it, you're to do that same thing right you have all the threats that's inherent with that software running with you okay now these two are special because in the OVAS top 10 these are not really the most common ones but these were picked by the people right the people who participated in the survey said these are the most problematic ones so these two ended up being in the OVAS top 10 so security logging and monitoring so we need logs right why do we need logs for anything yeah go back through a threat analysis, yep, yep, monitoring, yes, all right. So what if it's not proper or you're not able to get everything that you need from those logs? That's the problem. So whenever a security incident is triggered, that should alert somebody, right? So for example, if you find that one IP is attacking somewhere, I think someone just attacked us. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. So yeah. Uh, okay. Where are we? Yes. Uh, logging monitoring. All right. So we do need these logs to make sure if we are, you know, there is an attack happening, we need to be aware of it. So like I was saying, uh, suppose there has been an attack attempt from a particular IP. Okay. One IP is attacking you. And then after two minutes, we get another very malicious request on the same IP. So you need to keep tab of it, understand what's happening, and then understand what are the threats that could come in. Because you're seeing the same IP trying to do something malicious, right? So lo logging and monitoring is quite important. And then we have server-side request forgery, SSRF. Can someone tell me what SSRF is? Because we have a lot of security uh, experts here. I'm going to ask them. Uh, SSRF, server-side request forgery. Anyone wants to take a guess? I can hear murmurs. Anyone wants to go? Want to go? No. So yeah, server side request forgery. I think it's already written there. So you can just probably just read through it and <laughs> tell me what it is. Is it clear enough? No. Okay. Okay. So basically what happens is you're trying to communicate with the application server and then you are sending that data from the application server. You're so you're tricking that application server to communicate with the third server, okay? So we are a client, there is a server, and then there is an attacking server that we have, okay? This server is just created so that we can steal data. So this is a dangerous server. So what we make uh, through a server-side request forgery is, we are forcing this uh, server to believe that this is a very good source, you can trust it, and then there is a communication between them. So that is how, yeah, sorry? Uh, not really, not really, but yeah, uh, it's just making it trust the source and then communicate between the two. So you're able to redirect that request and then everything that you communicate with that particular application, whatever the client communicates with the server, it will be actually sent to the other server as well. So that is a server-side request forgery. Okay, uh, so any questions or shall we go to some real-world examples? Okay, okay, real-world examples is fun, right? Uh, because What's the point of discussing all these vulnerabilities if you don't look at the real world instances? So first of all, broken access control, right? So in 2015, there was a vulnerability in a Facebook business manager's page. They could actually uh, take control over any business listings, right? So Facebook has these business pages and they have admins assigned, but using a particular well-crafted payload here, they could actually take over control of that and then boot out the actual admins. So your website or your uh, service that was on Facebook is not yours anymore because someone has actually taken over control. And it was so easy that all that person had to do was modify certain stuff, right? Edit the role and then change the target user. So you, the attacker puts their user ID there and then put in the, the page ID of what they want to attack and then voila, that particular application, that page is yours under, uh, yours, yours for, to control, right? And then you have admin rights, you can kick people out. So I'm very confident in showing the code because it's now pick fixed. It's a long time ago. So yeah, don't try that. It's not going to work. But yeah, that's a typical example of a broken access control. Should this attacker be able to modify the admin of a random page by default? No, no, right? That's what we were talking about. We need to have the access rights set. Someone shouldn't be able to do that. But somehow they were able to do it and that's the broken access control part of it. And then we have cryptographic failures. So how many of you have heard about Cloudflare? Cloudflare services, perfect. So what does Cloudflare do? Sorry? Web hosting. It has uh, denial of service protections, DDoS attack protections, a lot of services, right? So in Cloudflare, they had an issue where they would have a memory dump that would disclose a lot of sensitive information. And this was known as Cloudblade, how, such a notorious name, right? So because they made uh, Cloudflare bleed, they called it cloud, cloud bleed. And th this happened in 2017, right? People were able to get a lot of information, such as the request send, they were able to get passwords, cookies, all the encryption encrypted data was disclosed because the dumps were not proper. So that is where the importance of cryptography comes in. You should have encrypted that data, right? And apparently, I don't know if this is a true story, but the guy who found this was actually just gifted a t-shirt. That's it. He was said, hey, thanks for your service. We're going to give you a t-shirt. Thanks for picking it up. Thanks for saving millions, but yeah, here you go. There's a t-shirt. Again, I don't know the uh, truth of that story, but yeah, let's keep it like that. Uh, and then there is the injections. So we have already talked about SQL injection, right? And excesses and all these injection attacks. So in an SQL injection, uh, what happens is, 
So 7-Eleven, everyone has heard about the convenience store in, in US. It's one of the biggest chains there, right? 7-Eleven. So they had an attack in 2007, 2007, sorry, my bad, 2007, where they were able to leverage a SQL attack, uh, a, a SQL attack or whatever you want to call it. They were able to go in, get customer's data. So this is the opposite of what happened in the first two cases. So people were good Samaritans in the first two cases. They were your typical white hat hackers. They were really good people. So they reported it back to the company, said, hey, you have a bug, you have an issue, you need to resolve it, make sure it's done, right? But this case, it's the opposite, because this was actually leveraged by attackers, and they kind of tried to make money out of it. So eventually they were caught and then sent to prison. So that's the moral of the story, always be a white attacker. But yeah, jokes apart, um, yeah, these people had successful injection attacks and not just 7-Eleven uh, stores, but other websites as well, and it caught up and they were arrested. So again, it's very important to make sure that there is protection against injection attacks. And then there is insecure design. I think we already talked about this in the examples that we mentioned. So the consumer botting attack is a very similar problem uh, that falls into the insecure design issue. So the vendors are not able to distinguish between a real user and someone who is trying to scalp the products, okay? Uh, so it can be anything. I think recently this issue was most noticeable with uh, NVIDIA, so any gamers here, people who like to game? Yeah, correct. So the NVIDIA graphics card at one point, it was very scarce during COVID. They didn't have enough raw materials to prepare it, so there's a huge crunch, we couldn't get graphics card. And then if you could get a graphics card, it could be sold at a high price. So what happened is there were a lot of attackers who would create bots that will go and buy this as soon as it comes on sale. So anyway, the bots are really fast, right? We can't be as fast as those bots. So naturally, the bots will buy everything and then next day it goes on other stores, on eBay and other stores for twice or thrice or even 10 times the price. And people would buy it. So that kind of scalping happens. So how do you prevent it? You need to have a design in place to prevent that, right? You need to make sure that you have genuine users using it. So, sorry? Yeah, CAPTCHA is there, definitely. But nowadays, even AI is able to bypass CAPTCHA, right? We have put in CAPTCHA, maybe another two-factor authentication, stuff like that will definitely help you. But nowadays, it's becoming more and more creative, more and more solutions also need to come up. So I think recently, many companies are leveraging AI to combat this as well. So they'll study the activities of these bots and try and distinguish a bot from a real user. So based on how the, the search pattern is, how they browse through an application, they kind of build a knowledge base and then try to identify which is which. Yeah. A bot or a person can yeah. only get by one at a time. Yes, that is all. That's a very simple thing you can do to fix it, right? But then again, there's a problem because, uh, okay, there are multiple ways we can create multiple bots. It's not really one bot that's buying thousands. You could create like a botnet that will just go ahead and buy a lot of stuff, right? So if you can create a host of bots like that, then there's a problem there. Can too. we identify that bots, like whether it is a coming from a can't identify that. I mean, there are so many ways to do it. So like I said, if it's coming from a singular IP, then there's a way to block it. So if it's coming from the same IP, then you can actually block that IP after a certain number of requests. Okay, from the same IP, if you have multiple... Bots, you can do it, right? Yes, there is a defense mechanism you can do it. So that is an example of uh, a, a distributed denial of service attack. So, so there is something called a denial of service attack, where like one person will send thousands or millions of requests, and then the server goes down the real users are not able to access it. That is a denial of service attack. The same can be leveraged as a distributed denial of service, where it's not really one device, it's a host of devices doing it. So it becomes a little more difficult to distinguish them. So naturally we need to use some AI and ML to make sure that we can understand the bot behavior and kind of distinguish it, right? Okay, security misconfiguration examples. So this is a little more uh, dangerous because like the United States Army Intelligence is involved, and then we've got the Australian broadcasting company, Accenture. So this was a cloud-level misconfiguration, which we were talking about in the past, right? So it was stored on an Amazon S3 bucket, so the storage was unprotected, leading to leakage of files, customer details, password, and like I said, it's the Army Intelligence, so definitely a lot of sensitive data was involved. So this is why we need to ensure that the cloud and how you access it, the, the, the key management, everything is also proper, right? And vulnerable and outdated components. Log4j, this is the most infamous one, right? Everybody must know about what happened with Log4j. So yeah, this happened in 2021. At that period, I think everybody was talking about this. 
if you were working in development you're trying to fix it if you were the security guy people were asking you why you didn't pick it up before right so yeah it's all about identifying uh, the component the issues in these comp components and then trying to fix it right so from time to time there will be patches that fix it you have to make sure that you are always updated Okay, so uh, yeah, sorry, when I mention about log4j, I think I should also mention uh, the RCE part. So remote code execution, any idea what that is? An RCE, a remote code execution, what happens in an RCE? Remote code execution, what could that be? You are executing code remotely, easy as that, right? So now you are able to run code on the host machine and that's a problem. So that is why uh, they were able to install like backdoors or maybe some mining soft, crypto mining software or put in ransomware. We talked about ransomware before, right? Where they encrypt your data and then ask for money. So that's also possible if you have a code execution where you can run code on the client machine, on the host machine, sorry. So yeah, uh, now let's also quickly look at how we can fix these up. So this is for the developers out there, right? Uh, even for the security professionals, but I'm going to primarily focus on the developers for this. So the first tip is never trust your user's input, right? But that's counterproductive to what we normally think, right? So when we imagine building an application, we would expect our user base to be really polite. We would expect them to be, you know, putting in... Exactly, exactly. So that is a problem. So if you have that mindset uh, when you're developing the code, you need to make sure that the user inputs are always validated before it's taken in, okay? You can't just randomly take in any user inputs. It needs to be validated and the security needs to be done. So a very a simple example is, we were talking about SQL injection before, right? How does SQL injection happen? Can someone tell me what is the most common case when SQL injection can be exploited? And SQL I can be exploited? Yeah. Right, perfect. Perfect, that's true. So uh, the user would craft an SQL payload and then post it as a normal user input, okay? And what happens at the back end is this particular input that comes from the user, it's just taken as is and then concatenated with your the rest of your SQL query. So now you are able to break their SQL syntax and then run whatever SQL code that you want to run, right? That's the biggest example. So you need to run parameterized query where you take in that query parameter, modify it, and then call a function to add it up together. Don't just simply throw it in together. You need to sanitize it. So what is sanitization? Clean it, right? Yeah, make it clean. So how does that happen? So I'll give you an example. You have an input field where you have to put in your username, contact number, and email ID. How do you sanitize those inputs? Or how do you ensure input validation there? Correct, correct. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. All right. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the rate and, and something like that. So you have to run like a regular expression to ensure these. And adding on to the, the contact number, if it's like a 10 digit number you need to enter, it only needs to be 10 digit. You shouldn't be allowed to under, enter hundreds or thousands of digits, which could cause a buffer overflow, whatever attacks, right? So you need to ensure that these kinds of checks are always there in place for your code. Okay. And then always stay updated. This is very easy, right? Whenever you're using third party libraries or whatever that's you're using to leverage to build your application, make sure it's always updated. So like I said, if there is a new vulnerability that's come out, if there is something uh, that needs fix, the company will fix it but you need to be aware of when it rolled out on how you can apply it. So always stay connected, always update it to the latest versions. Now credentials are very important. Can someone tell me what a strong password is? Can you give me an example of a very strong password? And then give me a weak password too. Okay. Okay. Minimum eight digits. Minimum eight characters. Okay, perfect, perfect. So what is a weak password to you? Okay, okay, like password one, two, three. Admin, admin, yes, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
that's kind of a, like a social engineering attack. So if I know you, I'll try and guess it. Yep, that's true. So yep, that's it. You need to make sure that the credentials have follow a certain level of security, right? It needs to be a combination of special characters, uppercase, lowercase, digits, whatever you want to throw it in there, right? And then there should be a minimum length for that as well. And then don't use dictionary words, right? That's a common thing that we always say. Don't use something that can be enumerated by an attacker. So the attacker doesn't sit down and put one word and then go for the next one and then go for the next one. He doesn't do that, right? He brute forces. He uses tools to just kind of throw random usernames at it. So if we're using very common and generic usernames and passwords, it poses a threat, right? So always make sure that the credentials are strong. And whenever you have a system where the application uh, asks the users to set up a password, it needs to have a certain level of quality, right? The strength should be maintained. Uh, just on the topic, how do you think, like, a, if you have a forgot password page, what all should be there to ensure security? Sorry? Yeah, account takeover might happen. So how do you prevent it for a, a password reset? OTP, yes, OTP. Security questions, they'll ask for their old password, just to see if you know the old password. Rate limiting, okay. And if it's a reset password, it comes to your mail ID, right? It can't really just click something and then try to put in a random one. So, yeah, these are all standards that needs to be implemented whenever we are coding something. And then, yeah, uh, think security when building applications. Like I said, this is very easy for me to say, but it's not really very intuitive for us, right? So. Uh, when we write code, we don't really think about the security aspects too much. We just want to write it and make sure that the clients are comfortable with it. Your end users are happy with your product, right? That's your end goal. But we need to start thinking about how this can be incorporated into how we develop applications, right? So, and that goes on to the early development stage because you can't really be the last stage and think, okay, oh, sorry, I just forgot to do input validation, then go ahead and do it, right? That's going to be hard. So, right from the get-go, you need to understand what all needs to be done, how you can secure your code, get all that sorted out, and then start the actual coding, right? Moving on to always keep least privileges. Like, again, we already talked about privilege escalation, right? So by default, there should be a zero trust. So whatever you have access to, there should be minimum confidence in you, right? If you're giving a user some permissions, it should be the least possible. If they don't need admin rights, don't give them admin rights. And make sure that they don't get admin rights too, okay? Keep your uh, privileges always controlled when you're coding. And then cookies. Cookies are very important. I think we already discussed this too much, so I'm not going to go into too much of it again. Make sure the timeout is there. Uh, you can need to have an expiry set for the tokens, so not just on the timeout. So after a certain while, it's definitely going to expire, and then you can't use it anymore, right? And then uh, we'll talk about server-side validation. Yeah, this is very important. So. When we talked about previously about input validation, right? We said, okay, we're going to use a regular expression to make sure that only certain characters are allowed. Should we do it in the UI front or should we do it in the back end? At the server side? So many answers. Back end or UI? Back end. Always back end? Always server side? Both. Okay, both is a good answer. Always server side? So actually, so, uh, if even if you do like an input validation on the client side, that's fine. But there should always be a server-side check also to accompany it. So server-side is a must, but like he said, you can definitely have both. Always always good to do both. But yeah, uh, because we, I mean, naturally we just expect our user to just type in stuff through the input field, right? But an attacker has so many other ways to inject the payloads. It doesn't really mean the UI front. He can actually modify the network call to make the changes. So the check should always happen on the server-side and never on the client ne never just on the client side. Okay, you want to do client side? Fine, I'm not going to say no. Okay, uh, I think uh, is this a good time to take a break now? Because I think I think everybody is getting a little bored. No, uh, I'll, I'll start singing otherwise, and then I'll I'll just have you all go out. <laughs> no, no, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. All right, I think uh, we'll break for a while, uh, yeah, 10, sure. 15 minutes, and then come back. Right? Oh, it's song. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> so I welcome Resmina. Uh, there will be a, a, like a small quiz session. Um, and you'll get a coffee as well.
Okay, and so let's uh, test your wits and expand your horizon by a fun and challenging quiz. Firstly, go to mendy.com in your browser. Dot com. So the first 50 members can join this quiz by entering the code shown in the uh, screen. The first five participants who answer the fastest will be the winners. So you should select the answer as fast as you, as you can. Uh, you all are ready? Let's start. Bye. So let's start. Let's go to the next question.
Uh, let's go to the next question. Okay, next, uh, next question. Go to next question. I'm going to go to the 
So how was the quiz? Okay, so let's get back to the session. We are here to know the trends, what is going to happen on cybersecurity, right? We want to know what is the future. And yes. I hope like that would be the next yes. most awaited session is up. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat>
So yeah, we'll get, get to the future in just a second. So before we look at that, so we now looked at the vulnerabilities, right? So how do you know the vulnerabilities? Can a security guy just look at it and decide, okay, this is vulnerable to injection, it is vulnerable? No. So how do I do it? Okay, pen test, scanning, okay, okay. All right, sorry? VAPT, yes. So VAPT is vulnerability assessment and a penetration testing aspect to it. So what is a PT? I'll show you a quick image so that it becomes easy for you. Papachita legacy, familiar with that? For those of you not familiar with that, we'll go for Ra uh, Rami Malek's one. <laughs> sorry? Oh, sorry. So that's from a Malayalam movie. So that's why we have on the other side Rami Malek from iRobot. Yeah, Mr. Robot, sorry. That makes sense for you more, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the typical concept of a penetration tester, right? So in movies, you see hackers who try to break into your machine, who have, you try to brute force, try to put in uh, other passwords, different other vectors. So they are the people who wear hoodies in movies and try to attack. That is your typical penetration tester. So in a penetration testing, you kind of manually try everything out, right? It's predominantly done in a manual format. And then there is something known as a, so th this will actually become your application security tools that you can use because these are mostly automated. You don't really have to have a human intervention to get these done, right? So there comes dynamic application security testing, DAST, static application security testing, SAST, and then a software composition analysis called SCA, okay? So the differences are all here. Like I said, penetration testing is predominantly done manually. So can you tell me what's the problem there and what's the positive there? No one wants to take a guess? What could be the positives when you say it's fully done by human beings, like very little automation to it or very little tools involved? What could be the downsides? What could it? Correct. Yep, the human intelligence is always great. So it can thoroughly scan through it. But there's also a big risk associated with it, right? And that is the cost and time. Because it's going to be expensive because we are paying people to sit down and then test it out. So penetration testing is always expensive. It takes a lot of time, but it's also very thorough because there is a human side to it. And then there is DAST. So DAST is all of PT, but done automated, right? So you have so many DAST tools that actually perform whatever the PT is doing, but in an automated fashion. So every request, every payload that a normal uh, attacker would try, a penetration tester would try, DAST does it with a tool. So that is the difference between DAST and SAST, sorry, DAST and PT. But again, because this is automated, there is very little creativity. There is only so much you can do. Yeah. Anything, like web can be tested uh, to an extent. We can do mobile as well with some tools and then web services can be tested. It can all be tested. The only challenge is there are certain scenarios where a DAST won't really work. So for example, we were talking about a multi-factor authentication, like a two-factor. So because it's an automated tool, it can't really go and pick SMS from your phone. It can't go pick emails that come to you, right? So there is some challenges to it. And there are also other cases where it won't really work. Like a privilege escalation sometimes is not really great with certain tools. So it all depends. But yeah, for more or less, it kind of gets the coverage done, but it's not really thorough. It wouldn't be as thorough as a PT, right? But it's very easy to set up. You don't, once set up, it's very little, you know, effort and time needed. You just configure the scans, just keep it running, right? Easy as that. And then there is the static application security testing or the SAST. So this is where they look at the code rather than the actual runtime issues. So DAST actually runs on the runtime. So once everything is built, everything is done, the servers are up and running, that's when you do a DAST because it needs all the components ready and it's a runtime testing. But with SAST, it's more focused on the source code. So it looks at the code, it looks at the vulnerabilities there, and then kind of picks up picks up the vulnerabilities from that. So like we already looked at, there are so many uh, fun vulnerabilities that are caused because of issues in code. Like we already talked about how, you know, lack of input validation can be a problem, how many injection attacks can be leveraged. So at the end of the day, many of the issues are caused due to inherent coding issues. And then there are some other security issues which it can't really pick up, like the configuration problems. And if it's like a server side issue, that can't be really result with a SAS, but as, as long as it's something in the code, SAS will be able to pick it up. 
and SAS is also pretty good because it just goes through the entire code it will report a lot of issues but the only problem is it's going to be really expensive and it will also take a considerable amount of time right and again it cannot detect runtime errors like I mentioned DAS is the one that runs on a runtime this one is during the coding phase or it just focuses on the code it can't really test like a PT does or like a DAS does it just looks at the code it runs through the code knows which could be vulnerable and reports it right is that clear yes yeah uh, so software composition analysis this is again very limited it can't really be used separately you need this to be combined with any of these other services right because it does not really exist on its own you can you can do an SCA to primarily focus on just the third party plugins and the other services that you have so suppose you have a lot of third party libraries that you use you don't know how many vulnerabilities are there so SCA is a quick tool that will look into that it will look at what is the composition of the other third party stuff that you have involved and then try to pick it up so that's where it differs from a SAS scan this yeah exactly no not for the regression testing not for the QA testing no this is strictly for the security testing sorry if that wasn't clear but yeah that's it so I've mentioned black box gray box and white box can someone tell me what the difference between the three are yeah right Inner field. Yeah, you have so much information about, about the system, that right? Organization. Right. Black box is totally you don't have any idea of that, uh, like mm -hmm. uh, the architecture, names, passwords, and yeah. credentials. Yep. And you have to trying from outside. Mm -hmm. And gray box is like you have a uh, half some sort of information. Okay. Some and information. Yeah, right. right. Perfectly right. Perfectly right. So just reiterating that point. So like I said, PT, you will have some information to test, but not the whole thing. It could be like a black box or a gray box. You have maybe you will get a URL, maybe you will get some credentials to work with, and that's how it goes. With DAST, it's like an automated process. You don't have much information. You will probably just get the username, credentials, the basic stuff. But when it comes to SAS, it's a white box because you get the entire source code. The entire source code of the application is being shared with you, and then you are asked to scan on it. So you have entire you know knowledge about what kind of languages they use, what kind of framework you use, everything about the infrastructure is known to you. So that is why it's known as a white box. So now, uh, again, let's, yeah, sorry, please, please. Yes, uh, open source, I'm not sure if we have any good things. It's most commercial licenses. So for DAST, I think we'll have HCL AppScan, which is pretty popular. It used to be IBM's, it's now HCL's. So HCL AppScan is pop, uh, proper. I think SAST, most popular would be Checkmarks. There's a tool called Checkmarks, which is pretty good. Uh, it does SAS tools. There are so many these days. Uh, so you can yeah google those and, and start with those sorry yeah sorry yeah most i mean there are a few open source ones there but there is one tool now right. PT we can use correct for that. yeah but there are tools but again the coverage of that is not really fully you know ensured and then we can try it out like yeah there are different tools that we can try out we're talking about the ovas tool right the ovas app yep ovas app yep there are a lot of tools like that that we can try out but an organization can't really do it because you know they need an organizational view they need to look at like hundreds of applications at the same time so some limitations will be there yeah uh, Azure we'll get to that in a second because I have a entire section that's coming up about the future technologies I'll get to you in a minute uh, yeah so <clears throat> basically that's that so now I have a question right jumping back to the organizational view I was talking about so as far as an organization is concerned we already talked about how PT is very you know intense you will find out everything in a PT so as an organization why wouldn't I opt for PT for all my applications I can do that right I can opt for PT but most of the time application I mean a company wouldn't choose all of their applications to go into a PT why why is that why are we doing a lot of PT sorry time consuming yes that's a point time consuming cost cost yep so my question is if I have hundreds of applications I'm an organization right I have hundreds or thousands of applications it's not really feasible for me to spend years to scan all of this in a PT uh, setup right because PT will take considerable amount of time I can't really do that and uh, not just the time the cost is also very high I don't really have much to spend on thousands of applications my developers keep developing new things every week we can't really do that so also there is a case where not every application will require a PT so suppose if it's a very basic application where you just go in look at some details 
find the contact us pages, just very basic stuff. There won't be any uh, places to put in inputs, you won't have places to upload files, cases like that, it's a simpler application. So even a DAS can would actually suffice, you won't really need a very extensive PT done. And then again, the data that the, uh, the application holds is also critical. So if it's like a banking app, definitely go for a PT, right? Because you will need it for certain regulatory compliance purposes. So again, depending on the application type, on, on what kind of data it has, and on several other factors, including cost and time, application owners will decide which goes where, right? Some could be sent to a PTQ, some could do a DAS, some could do a SAST. So it's up to the organization to decide the most cost-effective manner and time-effective manner to do it. Okay, uh, any questions on that? Okay, so this is how the entire process works, right? So like I already said, penetration testing happens towards the very end of your cycle, right? That is once you have completed your, so what is this? Can someone tell me what this is? Yeah, software development life cycle and SDLC, right, you're right. So in an SCLC, uh, this comes to the very end, right? The testing part is towards the very end. It's just before the deployment part. Because you build everything, you make it into a runtime, you host it on a, a lower environment like a UAT or a SIT, and that's when you do your PT at the very end of it, right? Because you need it to be completely uh, hosted and done and ready because it's a dynamic, I mean, uh, you do it on a real-time basis. You need the application. There is a tester who is sitting behind and doing it, right? So it, it goes so far towards the end of the STRC life cycle. And then DAS and SAS is very similar because DAS we already said, right, it needs a runtime to be testing. So it's a runtime scan, which means you need the application up and running to do it. So at any earlier stages, doing a DAS will make no sense. You can't really do it. You need the application hosted on the website, on the server. You need all the information already there. That's the only way we can do a DAS and PT. So that is why these two are way towards the end of an STLC. But SAST can be earlier. So it can be a part of the development and testing phase. So early on when you code, you know that your code is already written and at that point itself we can do a SAST. Okay, that much is clear, right? Because now we are going to talk about some future trends. So a big caveat when I say future, because some of these have been here for ages. Okay, some of these technologies are not new at all. But the only problem is that organizations don't use it a lot. Because there are still a lot of challenges they are working around. And some of these technologies, the, the, uh, the, en the environments and the companies are just warming up to it. So that is why I call it future, even though some are still being used and have been around for ages. So shifting left strategy, that's my first topic that I want to discuss when it comes to the future trends. So this is a very hot topic right now about how we can shift our security towards the left. Okay. So if, I, if you remember that previous image, this is what the PT and DAS and SAS timeline looks like, right? So we are actually proposing a future where we can move the security aspects from very end of the STLC to an earlier phase, okay? So the security that used to be there is no longer there. It's very, very early on in your software development life cycle. So can someone tell me what's the advantage of doing that or why uh, a PT or a DAS at the very end of the cycle is more dangerous? Okay, architect. Yeah, it affects the architecture. Very good answer. Correct. Yep. Go back and then redo everything, right? I think that's the common consensus. Yeah, I think that's a common consensus here. Uh, totally agree with it. That's the main problem, right? Because once the issue is identified, then the code has to be fixed. And very end of this timeline, at, at, towards the end of the STLC, Going back and fixing everything will break everything. We all know how we code, right? The entire dependencies will be lost if we go back and make the changes. So maybe we were talking about vulnerable components before. So suppose we were using like a third party library that has some vulnerabilities and it was only picked up at the very end of the cycle when we did a DAS or a PT. So imagine the pain of having to go back and then find a new library and make sure the dependencies are met, make sure all of your end use are covered right in that new tool so that is where the problem lies in because now it's going to take a lot more time and a lot more money for the company and there is a manual labor is also very high because now everybody has to go back make sure everything is fixed and then come back again if there is a new issue they'll have to go back and fix it again so it's a very dangerous cycle especially towards the end of your sprint so if you have the code ready you want it to go live soon 
and then you find the issues, it's going to take you a long time to go back and fix everything. Which is why the, the future of security is always shifting towards the left, so that we can incorporate everything in the earlier phase and then make sure that towards the end, we are just good to go. There is nothing wrong with the code or with the application at all. So you can see Hulk giving over the, the pen testing work to the dev. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, coming to that. So this is, so we talked about software development life cycle. Everybody is familiar with the software development life cycle. So here we have a new concept called a secure software development life cycle. We just added an S before it, SSDLC. So easy to name these days. Okay. So now let's talk about what's happening, right? So in the requirement phase, we are going to look at what is our security goals. So like I discussed in the past, right? When you're building an application, what kind of data will it have? What kind of users will it have? So I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, suppose it has uh, very basic information, but only people within the organization can use the application, okay? That's an internal application. But there is another website which the external people can access. So the security controls on both should be completely different. Because on one, there are other security measures which ensures that only people within the firm can access it, but the ones outside will need much more protection to be implemented, right? And just like that, like I said, uh, there are a lot of compliance mandates also, depending on what kind of data that you have. If you have health records, you need a HIPAA compliance co to be completed, you need a GDPR to be completed. So there's a lot of governmental regulations also to be followed. So if you start thinking about that right from the requirement phase, then it becomes easier for you. Because that is a phase where you define what inputs will come in, you will define what kind of database you'll be using. So if you start thinking about security from that phase on, it becomes easier, right? And then comes the design part. This is where you write your very basic uh, drawings of what you want to do and stuff like that. So during the design phase, that's where something known as a threat modeling comes into place. And I'm not going to go into detail about threat modeling because that will be another topic on its own. So basically in threat modeling, we have so many models like a stride model or other models which we rely on to define what kind of data is being used, what kind of security needs to be implemented. No, not at all, not at all. It's just a security architecture concept, right? Yeah, it's a threat modeling will actually define uh, how we can protect the data. So it's not really like the UI components or anything. It's about how you can define that entire uh, security structure, right? So you model the application, you define what are the security flaws, how you can mitigate it, what is the extent of these issues? So that is where the threat modeling comes into place. And then we go into the implementation phase, which is your coding phase, the road coding phase. You type in your code, make it ready, and then you can run a SAST. We were talking about how we can do a static uh, application security testing, right? Which runs through the code. That can now be integrated into the coding phase. And then uh, as we go on, we'll have the penetration testing, we'll have the DAST if you need, the SCA components, all that, deploying, and then finally monitoring. Because from time to time, there'll be new changes, there'll be new attacks, there needs to be a monitoring cycle also. Sometimes this is beyond the application scope, it might be some other you know, security team taking care of this, because uh, monitoring ca can be a little tricky. It could be from third party sources, which is tracked by like a firewall team. So that's kind of sometimes different, but still from an application perspective also, we can make sure that we constantly monitor the code and make sure it's proper. So that is the basic concept of an SSDLC. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, cool, moving on. Uh, DevSecOps. <clears throat> okay, so DevSecOps is kind of like similar to what we already mentioned with respect to shift left. It's not really, it's not as same as the shift left strategy, but here we are incorporating the entire security into our DevOps cycle. So is anyone familiar with what a DevOps model is? Okay. Okay, so can you like further explain what happens in a DevOps cycle? <laughs> yeah. Yep, perfect. So yes, timing is the biggest issue, right? Because once you have any, uh, once some test is failed, like your QA testing is failed, then you have to go back and fix the whole thing. So DevOps just wants a more agile, more fast way to build your code. So that is basically a DevOps. So now we are going to just throw in security onto DevOps as well, so that it becomes DevSecOps. I know security is just adding stuff onto existing stuff, right? SSDLC, DevSecOps, but yeah, that's what's happening. So as we already looked at, we are throwing in threat modeling, we are throwing in the monitoring part, the auditing part, the threat intelligence, SAS, DAST, SCA, everything is now incorporated. 
So if you look at the planning phase, they look at the compliances, they see what kind of uh, threat models should be done during the design phase and then they go to the code part. During coding, we do get SAST, we do SEA, we do all the code review part. And then we go to the, the final testing. Once everything is done, we move to the DAS scanning or if you want to do a pen test, we do that. And then finally we release and there's a cycle. It's an infinite cycle. That's why it's in the shape of an infinity. It just keeps going and going. But the advantage here is that now we have one pipeline where everything can be automated, which is what we're going to look at right now. So this is uh, a typical DevSecOps pipeline. So this is what your conventional DevOps pipeline looks like. And this is when you add the security aspects to it. So let me explain it a little further. Uh, basically all of this runs on a CI CD pipeline. So is anyone familiar with a CI CD pipeline? Yes, continuous integration and continuous deployment. That is correct. So basically what happens here is the continuous integration part will keep pushing whatever commits you have onto the main branch. So the biggest challenge with coding over different people is that from time to time we pull in new, uh, new branches to the repository and then we add our own code to these new branches. But then uh, if someone else wants to access the same code, they actually pull it and then they write their own branch. So it just creates infinite branches and sometimes there is a versioning issue. Right? So that is solved by a continuous integration where whenever a code uh, change is pushed, a commit is pushed, it will be written to the main branch. Okay? So we are imagining a situation where we are using GitHub or other uh, source code repository libraries which we leverage. Right? So that is a CI uh, part of the CI CD pipeline. And then we have the continuous deployment which means you are continuously deploying your application to a production server. It can be sometimes a lower environment too but you are always pushing it to the final release. Now why would you want to do that? Why are you doing a CI-CD model? Why not the conventional model? Like you said, the timing is one thing, right? Because if you wait till the last minute, you can't really deploy everything. If there is any dependency problems, if any, you know, uh, there is any discrepancy between the code that's pushed, it just throws everything into a TC, right? So we need to make sure that it's constantly pushing the latest updates and then we can just, at the lifetime, we can look at it, right? Once we push the code, it's matching with the CI-CD, it goes up, the entire code is reflecting on your application. That's it. It's pushed to your application itself. So you can in real time see what kind of difference is happening. And now along with the CI-CD pipeline, we are going to add all of our security guardrails to it. So like I said, the previous question was about, you know, when we migrate to Azure, which is like a hosting platform that comes in here, how would you actually put in security? So if you integrate it into a, a CI-CD pipeline, uh, or a DevOps pipeline which is supported by something like uh, Azure DevOps is there. So I think everybody can try this out. Um, this has a free account too if you want to try it or if you want an enterprise account you can go for that too. Azure DevOps or Jenkins are all tools that help you manage this. So if you want to really run an entire pipeline, these tools will help you. So you can then add whatever tools you want along with these. So Jenkins or Azure DevOps will have plugins for each and every one of these components. So be it the DAS tools like uh, we were talking about DAS and SAS tools, right? We have Sonar Cube, Fortify, Vera Code, check marks, all of these tools are there. We can quite easily plug that in. Similarly for DAS also, I don't know if it's all listed here. There are some DAS tools, but basically like AppScan or whatever other tools you want, you can integrate it into this. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Oh, what is the advantage, right? So basically we need, uh, the, the biggest advantage is the automation part, right? Now, if you want to ensure security to your build, you don't really need a security guy like me, right? Once you set up this pipeline, it's completely automated, right? So what's going to happen is once you push the code, the CI CD pipeline will actually combine everything, clean up everything, and it will push the code. As soon as it push, there is an aut automation process that will start the scans. So what it will do is it will uh, start a SAS scan and then that will run through your entire code. See what all vulnerabilities you have. And then it will share a report. As soon as the findings are there, it added to your entire list. You get a notification saying, hey, we have these many security issues. What do you want to do with it? And then it moves on to the, dev uh, the deployment phase. Once you deploy, you can run a DAS scan there. So like we already discussed, these automation tools for security can just be plugged in into the pipeline. And from time to time, you will get new findings reported. Sorry? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. The tools might not come with it. The You might have, 
I, I'm not sure if you get the. Uh, these are all third-party tools. The ones I mentioned, like the SaaS and DAS tools, they're all third-party tools. You need an enterprise license to leverage most of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think so because these are all different vendors, right? But for example, if you go to something called Burp Suite, Burp Suite has its own SaaS scanners, it has its own DAS tools, and you can also do like a PT using a Burp. So it has an enterprise thing that can do everything. And if you go to HCL AppScan, AppScan has its own DAS. It also has kind of a SaaS module, though I'm not really a fan of it. So yeah, there are certain security packages that offer a lot, but it needs to be within the same company. So if you have a package with that company, you can probably sort a deal with them to make sure you know it's cheaper for you. But yeah, uh, the, the advantage here is that uh, Azure DevOps and Jenkins have the opportunity to add whatever you want. There are like thousands of integrations that you can do. You can have integrations with any of these security tools that just plugs in and helps you out. Right? So the advantage here is, for example, if you find a vulnerability, right, you have the option to just stop the production. So rather than it going live with all the issues, it can just automatically stop based on certain findings. So suppose you find an injection attack. You can define the system to stop it completely. right? Or maybe you can say the moment you find five severity, like five critical issues, stop it. Or you can say maybe 10 issues are fine. So you can define the criteria on which the entire production will stop pushing its itself to the live state, right? So that is the automation component of a DevSecOps pipeline. You don't really have to do much. You just uh, run the code and that's it. Once you commit, everything is an automated process. Okay? The, any, any questions on the pipeline? Okay. Okay. Uh, nowadays, we can't really have a discussion without AI, right? So that's the last part of today's discussion. We'll talk about um, artificial intelligence and application security and look at some of the applications here. So the first thing is predicting the livelihood of attack vectors, right? So this is actually a decision tree that everybody has seen, right? But please don't ask me too many questions about machine learning. I'm going to blank out. I'm, I'm not a big person of machine learning. But basically, this is what a decision tree looks like, right? So let's look at cross-site scripting. We all talked about cross-site scripting attacks. It's kind of like an injection attack. So there are so many ways to fix it. So the first thing they look for is they check if this has been performed or not performed, right? If it's performed, then there is no way you can exploit it. Done. Closed. But if it's not performed, we have to check if an output validation is there. Because if the input validation is lacking, that's fine. You can just uh, validate the output so that the malicious payloads are not returned. So in the case of XSS, you can do something known as an output encoding, which will convert it into uh, HTML so that it won't really pop up as a uh, script when you're running it. So you can do that with the output validation. So output validation is there, then once again, the attack fails. But if it's not there, then it goes and checks if this can be returned. So these are actually three types of cross-site scripting. So that's why there is a classification there. This is like stored, this is reflected, and so on and so forth. So basically, it, it's just a tree that looks at the likelihood. And these numbers actually denote how much of an impact each thing has. Right? It defines how much of an impact it will have on the final output. So suppose if input validation is there, what level of uh, chances of a cross-site scripting happening is high or low, this is denoted by this number, right? So if it's higher, it means that it's very related to each other, and if it's not, it doesn't, right? So basically, AI can help you, machine learning can help you build charts like this so that it can actually understand the likelihood of an attack happening. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. In this case, the code, yes. Because we're looking at, uh, I mean, there are two ways to do it, this. So maybe we have other tools called IAST. It's like a combination of DAST and SAST. So what we try to do is we need to check for the output validation part as well. So this can actually be done with the source code checks. So like you said, I think even a, uh, combining it with the SAST would actually work out. So you can just have a source code provided, and then it can look at input validations, output validation, then come at the uh, resolution. So the code would actually work in that case. Yes, you're right. Yep. OK, uh, moving on to the next one. So automated code fixes. Yeah, this is something that uh, a company called Veracode has come up with recently. That is known as the Veracode fix. OK. So uh, apparently, so far, what we have looked at will just tell you where a problem is, right? So if you provide the source code for it, 
it will run through the code it will scan it and then it will flag what the issues are right that's it but going forward ai is so smart it will also suggest a fix for you right that is the future with veracode fix i think this came into being that the entire plan was happening like 5 6 months ago and i think they have their first version out now in the last couple of months so yeah basically uh, as we were looking at in the past this is an injection attack this is the case where we are talking about uh, how we need to make an input validation sorry an output encoding so this particular value i is just printed just as right as you can see here it's just printing out that value but this value can be dangerous because it's an input from the user right you can't really just output it we already talked about not to trust the user's input right so you need to actually uh, convert this and make sure that it's not really a sensitive thing when it comes on the uh, when it loads up on the website so this is the cross site scripting we are talking about so if there is a script that's being injected that needs to be sanitized and it shouldn't be run on the uh, browser during run time so at the run time the, what it does is this actually encodes i'm not sure if this is very readable i'm sorry but yeah basically uh, we are converting and making sure that these values are encoded when it comes out right when encoding happens that script cannot be run because now it's not in the form of an actual script with the brackets you write like a script that can be run on java javascript that's not allowed anymore because it's encoded and the output is actually encoded which means xss is no longer the case so verafix is working on this uh, veracode fix is actually working on this i don't know if it's i don't think it's a free tool you'll have to pay for it but yeah right now i think they have started rolling out so like you asked if you give the source code to it it runs through everything but rather than the conventional sas tool it will also now suggest fixes that are much more compatible and these days when we are using like chat gpt for coding a lot i know we all do right i mean chat gpt gives you a lot of great code snippets but that code is not inherently secure there are flaws with that too so when we are copying code from other sources and are not really sure what we are doing this is the right way to go because it will be able to pick up and i think in the future there will be more companies offering up the similar service is just that veracode just had a head start and they started with it okay and the last part is about threat prioritization based on attack severity so this is where organizations always fail right so let's imagine a scenario where we have run a scan uh, let's say a sas scan so sas scan will give you thousands of findings okay i'm not even kidding thousand is actually just an uh, I, i think i'm underselling it there could be millions of findings of these many could be false so that part is left for the security tester to decide like we'll have to go there manually make sure that the results are proper and still we give a report and the end report might have thousands of issues so from an organizational perspective how do they know which issues to fix first because they can't fix thousand issues together right at the same time they can't really fix everything so that is where uh, a prioritization is very important where they need, need to understand which attacks would be more popular so that is where the ai comes into place now ai has history of all the past attacks it looks at what are the dangers it looks at what are the losses it could incur it lo looks at whatever damage that particular attack can do and then it can rate the the severity so suppose we have 1000 issues it will actually prioritize the one based on real world scenarios what has happened in the past if a similar case was reported in the past how much damage did it cost to the company how can you remediate it how much time will it take so this will actually help organizations understand how to prioritize which applications to fix or sorry which vulnerabilities to fix uh, i think that pretty much sums up our topics so now i think i'll uh, leave the floor open for any questions any thoughts yeah mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> sure i can share about cloud security so to be honest cloud security is a different segment in its own right you can talk about all application security you want but cloud security is a completely different thing yeah about the yep uh huh this is logic bypass uh with re relation to a cloud okay yep there are some use cases definitely we'll share that so cloud security has its own like criteria that you have to follow like there will be a bucket scan that has to be run like it's like an amazon using amazon uh, s3 buckets then we'll have to run a bucket scan so it's a different security protocols that followed there but when you're building applications there is some things that you can follow that i'll i'll definitely share yeah migrating right <laughs> right right 
right mm -hmm. right perfect perfect yep I'll, I'll i'll share those details with you yep absolutely okay yeah yeah sure uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, that's really an excellent question. So this is much akin to the question that we have all the time, right? If AI comes over and takes over our jobs, what do we end up doing? No, that's a great question. Uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, if you want to work on DevSecOps, the future is bright right now. Because there are not many people who can develop an entire CI/CD pipeline. So we looked at a pipeline there. Right? This is like a very rough framework. This is not really something that you can like put into a live environment and have it working. There needs to be a security architect who can build this up. So people who know how to build up an entire CI/CD pipeline, they are in high demand right now. If you can actually come in and build an entire CI/CD pipeline, but then the security analyst can kind of like go away because they won't be needed much. They'll still be needed in a lesser role, but they won't be really that involved. But early on, when we are building this pipeline, they'll be very important. And like you said, uh, if it comes to SSDLC, at that point, when you are building that entire SSDLC framework, at that point, the security guy will be really, really important. So if you want to go that route, the opportunity is definitely there. And at this point, I think DevSecOps, almost every organization is starting to move towards DevSecOps, or they already have some small pipelines already in place. So the future is going to be bright for DevSecOps. And then what about yeah. the security people like I've yeah. seen so many uh, security people yeah. who are just into the security not just into the coding or the yeah. development operation side. Mm -hmm. So what do you suggest for those people yeah. who want to thrive in this industry? Yeah. So uh, if penetration testing is the way to go, if you like that, you'll always have a job. Trust me. I mean, I know that, uh, you know, when we hear about DevSecOps and how that can solve all the issues at the end of the day, it won't be as good as a PT guy sitting down and doing the testing right because there is a human intelligence like we were talking about there are some certain business case logic bypasses which really the tools can't leverage so at the end of the day you are really good at cyber security you really want to be a red teaming guy you want to do a penetration testing the floor is all yours you will definitely have an opportunity so there actually you're just narrowing down the opportunities yeah. out there but mm -hmm. efficiently making the absolutely process yep more yep yep so true so true because if you want perfection, then you need to pay for it, right? <laughs> right. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, five years from now, cyber security. I think shifting left would be something that every company will have by then. We'll have more SSDLC, we'll have probably DevSecOps. I think that's completely built in the next five years. Uh, some other trends that I see developing is we'll have security to be more focused on container security, on cloud security. Those are less explored these days. But in the future, the focus will be on those. And additionally, we are going to see a lot more of blockchain based applications. I didn't really talk about this. It's called as a distributed applications, right? So that is another technology that's growing up. So rather than having one server hosting something, you're going to distribute it distributed apps. So that is something where I see uh, security could be taking a venture into and see how we can explore there. But again, no one knows, right? AI, if you told me the generative AI would grow so much over the last three years, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have never trusted you. But look at where we are. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Did you have a question? No. All right. Um, anything else? So this uh, SDLC and while comparing with this secure software development yeah. life cycle, we are checking, uh, applying security in every phase of the uh, process. So Correct. we have any like uh, comparing to the SDLC, is there any cost wise uh, increased in this secure development life cycle? Uh, of course, because now you'll have to bring in a security, an actual security architect into the mix because that security architect will have to look at every workflow in that SDLC. They'll have to decide what goes in, what goes out. So that structure-wise difference is there. But then again, depending on what you want to deploy, that might change, right? So for example, if you want to meet a lot of regulatory compliances, then that is more cost on your side, on the organization side. Uh, and yeah, depending on what kind of security that you want to impose, that will change. 
but definitely it's going to be a little more costly because you need a security architect to be you know sitting with you throughout that entire stlc process so yes uh, sclc will be expensive but i would say in the long run it would be cost effective because you will have lesser issues with the application you won't really have to run around trying to fix it at the last minute it will be much more secure so yes there will be a part uh, that will cost you more but on the long run i think that will be covered and in that uh, while you are discussing about that uh, top 10 vulnerabilities yeah. you mentioned that uh, there have been an attack in that amazon s3 Mm -hmm. like uh, generally amazon services will be yeah. secured and they yeah. are also offering some penetration testing yeah. like penetration testers yeah. will be uh, pen testing the services mm -hmm. but uh, which uh, which thing would be would be lead to that attack uh, do you have uh, any opinion i think we were talking about the real world scenarios right yeah. where we were able to expose it like that was the case right no like actually uh, 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 oh yeah s3 scanning right so basically i think the scenario we were talking about where when uh, i think it was the access keys disclosed was it the example that i gave where we were able to uh, s3 buckets one second uh, one second uh, the real world scenarios oh the real world scenario right 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 right, right. yeah and that uh, oh yep 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 uh to be honest i don't remember what the actual issue here was mm. it was unprotected right uh, leakage of files customer details uh you know what i'll check on this and i'll get back to you i'm not a hundred percent sure i don't know if it was disclosed publicly at the time because amazon s3 I, I believe at the time we're saying oh no it's not possible we didn't exploit it's not exploitable so i'm not sure how this happened i'll probably check on this and get back yeah, to you because uh... right 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 uh-huh <laughs> right yeah, a human like, error uh, last month they attended yeah. a seaside conference in yeah they conducted a, a session on this aws right. testing yep so they mentioned that we yep. can actually attack uh, is the amazon yeah, yeah yeah absolutely yep yep, yep. i mean amazon is... definitely has its own protection mechanisms right so, so more or I'm less asking. it's either us not you know securing our keys and other our access tokens or it could be some other miscommunication so this was happening a little ago right in 2017 uh, i'm not really sure what caused it but I'll, I'll get back to you on that but i think it was definitely some misconfiguration from the you know like i said we have to be sure that we know where every you know aspect is stored we need to make sure that our part is covered right from amazon's part definitely they'll look at it but uh, we'll have to ensure that our local keys are also protected uh, in a similar fashion so i think it was a similar case where that was exploited but i'll, I'll check on that and i'll get back to you okay. yeah applications which actually make us use security yeah. applications so like in the next <laughs> three four years what is going to happen there uh, sorry i didn't get that applications that like hacking applications uh -huh. so since ai and all are coming into the yeah. picture like what is the future for the hackers for the hackers like, uh like yeah now, like, yeah like where the ai model actually uh, right right so what is the future of the hacking yeah i mean <laughs> yeah uh, personally i correct exactly right so i mean historically hackers have always been one step ahead of the security people right that's why we are always running to fix everything that's why we have zero day vulnerabilities which just you know gets reported at the last minute so that happens all the time i would say they will still remain one step ahead even with the ai with all the other tools they could also leverage the same thing right so eventually i think it's always going to be a, a chase for the security team to make sure everything it's is like up. only if you have robbers there's a job for police. exactly 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 true. yep yep <laughs> so yeah the attacks are definitely going to keep happening uh the way the attacks happen will definitely change because uh, i mean it's not really related to application security but ai is now used for scamming a lot right where you can uh use deep fakes or other technologies to actually uh scam people of money so that is also cyber crime to be honest so uh, the industry is just going to keep growing like it has always done and that is probably also why cyber security is in high demand right because people still have to keep updated and then uh, keep growing yep. uh, 
Yep. 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 So when that uh, OR scan is uh, generated, it's generated by some cyber security uh, professionals, mm -hmm. right? So it's uh, based on like previous uh, how many that. Uh, yeah, the instances where it yeah, was reported. It, yes. Uh, or the severity of the their like that arrangement, one to ten arrangement, like one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's usually the most popular ones. It can't really be the most sensitive ones. So, for example, if you consider something like a remote code execution, that's very dangerous, right? But it's not really in the top 10 because we're just looking at the most reported classifications, right? So, injection is very popular. The occurrences, yes. The occurrences. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I think we are good, right? Yeah. So imagine you are just 18 years old, 19 years old right now. Yeah. And what would you give to your younger self? Yeah. Uh, as an advice mm -hmm. to grow in this industry right now in 2023. Ah, okay. Very good question. You kind of caught me on that, especially when you say, okay, well, how do you grow yourself in the cybersecurity industry by going to the past? Uh, yeah, 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 the technology is going to be completely different from what we are having today. Of course, yeah. So the only way we can survive is keep up with the trends in yeah. technology. If you are in cyber security, yep. keep up in the trends in cyber security. Yep. If you are in another field, keep up in with the trend in Absolutely, that. absolutely. Especially in cyber security because like we said, the attackers always want to one up you. They keep coming up with new ways, new vulnerabilities, new exploits, new attack vectors. So you'll have to constantly be updated. So that's definitely going to be one thing. Uh, if you ask me what I would have done, I don't know. I, I think I might have done a little more uh, focus on red teaming uh, because that's really very unexplored territory at this point. So I might have looked more into that. But I mean, I'm happy with what I'm doing right now, but <laughs> I would definitely have looked into that more. All right, I think I think that's it. Thank you, thank you for your time, and thank you, Fire, for having me. I would I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to him. Uh, it was very uh, very informative and very engaging session. I, I must say that. Yeah. So I would. I'm so happy and proud. Three years before. <laughs> Class representatives. Hmm. So yeah, so I would like to invite uh, Deepu, MD of Fire, to give a small token of appreciation. Yeah, I am. I am the part of the committee. So the formal session has ended, but uh, you can use this opportunity for uh, networking. Uh, Let's we, have a photo yeah, we'll have a photo together. Yeah. So the official session has ended. Okay. So how was the session? <laughs>